in our five part series on uh, in a recruitment for retention academy series. So today's topic is building the foundation of your recruitment efforts, process team, and action steps. My name is Shannon Sutton, and I am here as a consultant supporting the Delta Regional Delta Region Community Health Systems Development Program, which is providing this webinar today. And most of you probably have seen a slide that looks like this before. The, the Delta program is funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy in collaboration with the Delta Regional Authority. As you probably just heard, the webinar today is being recorded and it will be posted to the center's website. Kayla Lazinski will send the recording and the slides to, to all Delta program hospitals. Caleb has also, let me look at my chat to see if I'm telling the truth. He has not yet, but he will shortly um, put a link to the slides in the chat box and another link to a handout that you can refer to during our breakout discussion today, where we'll have one breakout discussion um, in, a, in a little bit here. We'll share that link again right before we send you to breakouts, but if you're someone who likes to have things ahead of time, um, please feel free to click on that link now and pull up the handout. Throughout our time today, we encourage questions and discussions. If you have a question or have something to add to the conversation, please feel free to unmute your line or use the chat box. But if you're not speaking, we just ask you to keep yourself on mute to cut down on feedback. We'll be putting you, as I said, into small, small group breakout discussions. And during those breakout discussions, we of course encourage you to uh, take yourself off mute to have a conversation. And if your bandwidth allows, it's nice to see faces. So if you can, if you can do it, we encourage you to, to put your video on while you're in breakout discussions so you can see the others in your group and they can see you. Before we get started, please take a minute to find the chat box and type in your name, your title, and your organization, just so we know who's here today and our presenters know who's with us and get a good feel of the audience who's here today. So as I mentioned, this is a five-part series, and the topics for each session are shown here on this slide. The first four sessions will be led by our partner, 3RNet, the National Recruitment and Retention Network. And our last session is a little bit different. So rather than having a formal presentation, that last fifth session will be made up of informal small group discussions where well, you're, you'll have the opportunity to share any challenges you're facing um, related to recruitment and retention and get input from your peers in the program just to learn how they've addressed some of the issues you're facing. We also will have a few hospitals kind of sharing their own practices that so that you can learn from them and ask, ask questions and get ideas from, from some of your peers in the Delta program. So as we go through the session today, please keep an ear out for anything you'd really like to have the chance to ask your peers about in that last session. So we, we, we really wanna make this last session as meaningful as we can for you. And so we need your input to do that. So you can share if you have something you'd like to hear about in that last session or talk about, um, please share at any time in the chat. You can unmute yourself and say it out loud. And we'll also have an official poll question at the end so you can um, enter your thoughts in SurveyMonkey so that we've, we've got a lot of different avenues to get input from you. I would like to introduce our presenters for today before I turn things over to them. So Mike Shimmons will be a speaker today. Mike has over 20 years of experience in the recruitment of healthcare professionals, and he served as the executive director of 3RNet, as I mentioned, the National Rural Recruitment and Retention Network since 2012. Prior to coming to this position, Mike worked for six years at the Missouri Primary Care Association as Director of Recruitment and Workforce Development. And there, he assisted 21 community health centers and other Missouri hospitals and clinics in their health professional recruitment efforts through the Missouri Health Professional Placement Service. Mike's first recruitment position in healthcare was as Director of Medical Staff Development at St. Mary's Health Center in Jefferson City, Missouri. He served in this role for nine years and recruited for all physician specialties and advanced practice nurses at this 167 bed hospital and affiliated clinics. Mike has a bachelor's degree from Missouri State University and a master's degree from Western Illinois University. We also have Jennifer Higgins here today um, to talk about, about uh, generations. She's held roles from Director of Human Resources and Workforce Development to Chief Operations Officer in an FQHC setting and has worked closely with 3RNet, both as an employer and training consultant since 2012. 
In 2019, Jennifer and her family relocated to Destin, Florida. We just checked. She was feeling pretty safe with the weather today, in case <laughs> you're wondering. Um, um, so she um, now works as the community operations director for Shoreline Church. In 2005, Jennifer earned her Bachelor of Science in Human Resources Management and Business Administration from Franklin University in the nonprofit healthcare industry, specifically federally qualified health centers. She spent three years as the Workforce Development Director at the Ohio Association of Community Health Centers, developing relationships and serving on project committees on both local and national levels. In 2013, Jennifer obtained her employee retention professional certification. So thanks, Mike and Jennifer, for being with us today. And um, Mark Barclay is with us again, who presented in the first session. And he'll get us started with a quick refresher of the hierarchy that was covered in the last session. So Mark, I will turn things over to you to get us started. And I will stop sharing. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. <laughs> So um, I just wanted to cover a quick slide or two here just to kind of give a quick recap of where we ended off last session. So if you can remember last session, um, we had kind of framed our um, recruiting for retention hierarchy based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So the premise being that we have to work from the bottom up. So before we can move uh, to our safety needs, to our love and belonging, we have to satisfy our physiological needs. And that is the same premise with our recruiting for retention hierarchy. So last uh, session, we gave you kind of a, an overview of the entire hierarchy moving all the way up to what really sets, in our opinion, rural and underserved areas apart in their recruitment efforts, which is culture. Um, so what we're really trying to strive towards through the next couple of sessions is working our way up through this hierarchy to unleash um, and, and take full advantage of that, that culture that we can offer in rural and underserved areas. So today, what Mike is gonna get us started on is the foundation of, of this entire hierarchy, working through our recruitment process, uh, finding out who's involved with that process, um, documenting the process, and just getting stakeholder and community support. So today, as far as the hierarchy goes, we're really gonna be focusing on that, that, um, that bottom block, the recruitment process, and in the coming sessions, we're gonna work our way up through candidate motivation, strategic marketing, and regeneration. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Mike to get us started on the recruitment process. All right, and thank you, Mark, for, um, for getting us started there. Uh, what happened to my, hang on, sorry. Okay. Sorry, make sure this is the right one. Thank you very much, um, Shannon, and thanks, Mark, for kind of giving us a, a recap of, uh, of last week. I'm, I'm very happy to join you all today and talk about one of my favorite parts of my work at 3Rnet, and that is just discussing kind of the process of recruitment and retention. I do think it's um, vitally important, uh, the great foundation for this. I do want to give an acknowledgement to both Michelle Varcho and Mark Barkley uh, for the slides that we're going to review. Uh, today because um, uh, they did help and put these together. So I definitely want to uh, acknowledge their support for that. So um, so we'll go ahead and jump in here and, and, and kind of spend some time really on the four phases of what we call the recruitment and retention process. First of all, is this your idea of or current strategy for recruitment and retention? Um, find, hire, train, replace. Uh, sometimes even the hiring part right now is difficult. We know that because uh, you know there's there's fewer candidates. COVID has changed everything. We'll get into that in just a minute. But you know what we're trying to avoid is this process, right? The circular process. We're trying to get a, a a better process in place that maybe keeps folks around longer and more satisfied in their work. So if this is your strategy, this is what we're trying to move away from. The new normal is basically again. We can't do anything right now without kind of the, the shadow of, of COVID-19 still over all of our work. And that includes recruiting efforts, retention efforts, everything around the workforce is different. And we totally understand that. Um, many of you may have been pulled away from your jobs, as a matter of fact, for the last year and still uh, working on other issues besides uh, perhaps your HR or your, your recruiting or, or retention efforts. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we, we need to still make sure that we Keep an eye on this process and help you uh, look at ways to continue uh, being successful with this. So 
COVID-19 has put a lot of spin on it. There's actually some really good things that come out of it. Uh, and I think there's also meaning like virtual interviewing and things like that has been probably an advancement. Um, but there's obviously a lot of uh, negative to it as well. So it's just going to be around um, for a while and the, the impact will be around even longer. So here's some just core beliefs of 3Rnet and kind of just setting the stage for what we kind of think of as the recruiting for retention process. First of all, um, recruitment for retention is a process. Just like your quality initiatives or anything you do in healthcare, you always think in process terms, right? And procedures and things like that. There is certainly that to this as well. And we're going to kind of outline, that's why we have four parts of this to kind of understand where, where that comes into play. And also teamwork is vitally important. Um, when you, and we'll discuss this a little bit more in a minute, but when you are a, a, a department of one and you may be the only person doing recruiting of staff or retention efforts or doing a whole bunch of things, you have to have help. There has to be a team to help you do that. And when you're in a rural area, especially, there's just not as many bodies. Um, it certainly can make a difference. I was lucky when I was recruiting for a hospital, that was my full-time job was recruiting. Um, most places, and you guys probably do not have that opportunity. You're probably mixing many other jobs with that. So process and teamwork are definitely going to be an important part of this. Uh, competition, obviously, right now is fierce. Um, competition for every health professional is, is tough, whether it's nursing, lab techs, you know, not even to say physicians, nurse practitioners, all that, everything is pretty fierce right now. And again, COVID put a whole other layer on this. We've had people leave the workforce. Um, there are jobs available that people just don't want to take. Um, it was a very hard, it has been a hard year and a half on health professionals. So they've been on the front lines. So definitely you, you're going to have to work even harder and, you know, to find candidates because the pool is probably shrinking a little bit as well. So it's got to be candidate driven. You got to really think of it from the candidate's perspective. Thirdly, recruitment is both an art and a science. Um, science, I just kind of told you, process, procedure. There's, you know, there's actually steps that you can take that we think are very important. But if everybody had the same manual, everybody would be successful. That's not the case. You, we all have the opportunity to be successful with this, but you have to put your own spin to it. Every uh, person on this call today works for an organization that is totally unique. You may be even located in the same state, possibly even the same county or very close to each other. You know, you're all here under kind of the Delta guys. You're pretty centrally you know, located. That doesn't mean you're not totally different when it comes to how you're gonna go about your processes and trying to recruit health professionals to your organization. So we'll give you some of the process. We'll give you some of the ideas on how to make it your own. And I think that one of the biggest things I always want to get across is we got to remember that um, there are whole organizations dedicated to recruitment and retention of health professionals. Um, large systems have multiple people doing this. Why is it different in rural? It's all about scalability. When you are a health system like, let's say, Sutter in California, that's recruiting for multiple hospitals, they have a whole department probably 40, 50 people that are doing recruitment and retention efforts. They're scouring the country for health professionals. You don't have that luxury. So you have to be very creative and strategic about where you spend your resources and dollars and your time to try to find the candidates that are going to work for your environment. You know, more than likely, you may not run into Sutter Healthcare in California if you're located in Mississippi. However, your large health systems there in Mississippi may be your competition. How are you uh, creating an image uh, for yourself? So um, so basically, science and art are, are part of this. People and tools exist to help. There are a lot of uh, resources out there, uh, free and low cost or organizations that are helpful, uh, including 3Rnet is just one of many. And we'll go through some of those as well um, as we go forward. And then the new normal. Um, this has not changed. Our, our core beliefs for recruiting for retention did not change with COVID. Again, there's a different lens on it. But uh, if anything, it's amplified the importance of these efforts in your workforce, because everything we hear after people coming out of COVID is all about workforce. How do I keep workforce? How do I recruit workforce? Again, these, these tenants have not changed. So this is the first glance at kind of the four parts of the process, at least the way that we see it. Uh, and we will run through all of these. This, this presentation today is gonna to be a quick run through of the overall process so you kind of get the highlights. I have done full day presentations on just one of these steps, much less all four of them. So you're gonna get kind of the high level run through on what this is, and we'll continue to build on this over the next couple of sessions and ongoing. So um, just know that this is where we believe the four steps kind of really lead you through. There's the planning and preparation, marketing and finding candidates, 
most people jump to this part and kind of do that first before they do the, the other one. That's when we'll talk about that. Matching and committing, which is basically the hiring process, and then retaining for life cycle of the employee, all about trying to keep the people that you spent so much time recruiting with you. Um, so those are kind of what we see as the four parts of the process. And we've just recently realigned some of these internally. Uh, we've been working on our own uh, processes as well as we're working on a major um, website redesign. We're also redesigning some of our materials. So this is kind of the new um, way that we have broken up our, our uh, uh, process. Again, it didn't change anything. It just kind of is repackaged it a little bit. So here's some of the steps kind of within that. If you're kind of wondering what are all these things that you're doing, if we have four parts of the process and kind of look at this, I would look at this in terms of what are we doing right now in our efforts when it comes to recruitment and retention? Are we doing most of these, some of these, all of these? If you're doing all of them, great. You guys are set, or at least you're doing a really good job. It doesn't mean you're always successful, but at least it means you have a good process in place. But if you just see some things on here, it's like, well, we don't do hardly, you know, maybe a few of these things in that category. Well, that's where we want to try to build it up for you to understand that that's why these are important. So um, we'll go through each one of these, um, like I said, a kind of a high level review and be thinking about this in terms of your own operation right now. How do we do these in our facility? Who's in charge of them? And that kind of thing, who's, who's responsible for the different components. So those are the action steps that we feel are most important and that we'll keep coming back to. So when Mark was talking about building the foundation, this is where you build the foundation and you make sure that you have these parts covered. So again, four parts, planning, preparation. Let's jump into that real quick. So there's multiple steps to this. And I think one of the things that we have found at 3Rnet over the many, many years, 3Rnet's been around for 25 years, or actually more now, it's 1995. Um, a lot of times people jump past planning and preparation because they don't have a process in place to begin with. They recruit by need. Somebody has left, there's, a, there's something that's happened. We, we didn't have a, a, a real good eye sense of what we're gonna need if that person leaves. So uh, the first thing you need to do is uh, talk about assessing the need. Um, assessing the need is really just because a, let's say, let's say a, your most productive nurse practitioner leaves and you need to hire somebody else. This is the opportunity to kind of look at that position and understand, do we, do we definitely need the skill sets that are departing or is there a different way to kind of look at this? The same way with really any position, I think about that when it comes to like, maybe if you have a dental program, if you're hiring a dental hygienist, can you hire a dental assistant? Same thing with lab techs or front office people. Do you, do you know the type of person you need to replace with? Have you done a gap analysis to kind of look at the skill sets? Do you understand really that this is a one-for-one one recruitment. Or as you're kind of looking ahead, if you're being more proactive with your recruitment efforts, what are we going to need going forward? You know, we're opening up a new service or we're bringing on a new uh, provider that's going to require some maybe additional support staff. So conducting that gap analysis of your operations versus the staff you have and the staff you need and understanding if somebody departs, what will you be looking for? And basically, like I said, more proactive uh, approach to assessing that. Make sure you recruit the right position is what we're saying. Um, I can never overestimate or overstate the next one, which is build your recruitment team. We will spend some more slides on this after that, uh, after this, because it's, it's such an important part. Uh, many of you may be a one person team. Uh, like I said, I recruited for a hospital as the only person doing recruiting, but that meant, you know, I was lucky I had full time effort at that, but I had to use a lot of folks to help bring in candidates and, and show them, you know, our town, our, our, um, the hospital, different parts of the hospital, um, salary negotiations, all those things. A lot of those were, were not in, within my hand. So I had to cooperate with a lot of people. Um, you've got to build a recruitment team. Uh, you build teams all the time in hospitals. You build teams for, you know, JCO review or whatever, you know, qualification, you know, uh, quality qualifications you have to have. You're built, you're constantly building cross departmental teams. This is the, one of the most imperative things that I'll get through today. If you don't have a recruitment team kind of operating in some fashion within your hospital, please examine that. We'll go through some of the parts of that here next. Defining your opportunity is also very key. And that is just understanding what exactly you're offering to candidates for that position that's different than everybody else. And they're called unique selling points. So what is our position, our town, our hospital have different than everybody else? And that includes a wide array of things. And we'll go through those as well. And then not lastly, but certainly part of this, um, creating a budget. Um, this is probably a really neglected piece 
a lot of folks don't, because you don't always know exactly what you're going to be recruiting for. But if you, if you kind of get a team together and you start looking historically about how much money you're spending on recruitment or retention efforts, um, you certainly want to, you can get a, a, a pretty good handle, I think, on what this is going to cost. It may include site visits. It may include marketing. It may include any search firms or anything else that you use. If you use any external for, uh, sources, if you're using locum tenens companies, uh, anything like that, uh, traveling nurses companies, you know, create a budget so you kind of know what you're spending on this operation because you may come down to it to see that, you know, we're spending so much money, we could probably hire somebody internally and do a lot of these um, objectives and, and, and help us out even more. So creating a budget is kind of one other step in that planning and preparation. So, okay, some national observations is, um, again, recruiting and retention are not just one department's role. It is the entire organization's role. So how you kind of form your recruiting and retention team, identifying those individuals um, that are going to have different action items in the recruitment and retention process. And also make sure you look beyond your hospital, but look beyond your facility for your team. Um, that can be board members, people in your community, civic leaders, realtor for one, um, always helps. A real good realtor who knows your area, who can give tours of the community, um, who also understands how to listen for cues from candidates. Uh, that may be shown around again. This is a lot for those people you're hiring from outside. I understand they're coming in maybe to your area that are not familiar with it. But you really want to have kind of a broad range of people that you can pull from that will speak highly of your organization. They're your supporters. They're your champions. They're the people you want to be putting out there that will share real information with candidates. So when you're building your team, look beyond all that and kind of look for those people within. And I, I sometimes say this in a small town, when you talk about rural recruiting, it can be really interesting because you may have somebody that in your operations, in your hospital, may have a role that totally doesn't seem like it would be somebody that would be fitting. Like, for example, the president of the school board may work in your cafeteria. You never know. Small hospital, you, that certainly could be potentially the thing. Or head of the PTA. That would be great if somebody's coming to visit that has children that wants to know more about the schools. They may be a really important person on your team for that particular recruitment. So always think about kind of who are your resources within your facility that know things about, you know, uh, all the aspects of your community in your area. So when you form that recruitment team, these are all the different people that we just kind of went through. So, you know, the, the, no matter what the size of the organization, whether you're a um, 25 bed hospital, 100 bed hospital, wherever you are, everybody's going to have to go through this process and have a team. Um, and you also need to assign the roles. We're going to have, we have a checklist here we want to look at next, but and, and members of this team may wear more than one hat. If you're, the, if you're the prime person in this, let's say you're the one who's answering the phone calls. You're the one who's the intake of candidates. You have to know all of that. You probably are also coordinating a lot of the other efforts. And again, in a smaller operation, you might have many different roles that you're um, uh, hosting. So I certainly want you to be thinking in terms of that this isn't just a one person doing one operation thing. It's going to be one person is going to wear many hats within this. However, the more people you can flesh out of this and make it a, a more comprehensive team. And the other thing about this is this should be a group that just doesn't come together every once in a while. Um, there are some teams that you pull together at your hospital um, for one time operations, right? Whether it's a, you know, an event that you're putting on or again, uh, if, if Jayco's coming to town, sometimes that's a year long process. But after that year, you kind of goes away. This should be an ongoing effort an ongoing effort. And I think you'll be hard pressed to succeed if you don't have an ongoing effort at this. And, um, and that's even if you're not recruiting, you're always still talking about the staff, the workforce, how are they feeling about the job and, and about your organization. So again, this is a, a, a checklist that we have um, that we can make available or will make available or have made available, I'll say, um, that just kind of walks through the different action steps where you can assign roles. You know, this will this will even give you a tool to kind of get started. It's not the be all end all. It is a guide. I want you to kind of think of it in terms of that. If you have certain uh, things that you want to add to it or you don't want to do that, that's fine, too. But this ought to get you kind of started on the way to assigning the roles and understanding if you're if you're in charge of this process and you have 10 of these action plan items on your plate and only three or four people helping you, it's going to be a hard press to be successful. So, again, try to try to look at these roles and assign them and understand how they're gonna play out going forward. So this is a tool that I think will be very helpful to you. Hopefully it'll give you um, some good opportunities, kind of like I said, if you haven't got this started. And again, when we kind of go into our breakouts, I do hope to hear from you all if you have 
what you have as a recruitment team right now, anything partially, whatever you got, I'd love to hear from you what, um, what kind of things you're doing right now. Okay, so I've kind of preached enough about the team because that's where I usually get off on really bad. So I'll come back here to uh, defining your opportunity. Defining your opportunity is understanding the job is not just the job description that you write up for HR purposes. The opportunity is really about the whole offer that you're making to a potential candidate who's gonna to come to work for you. That may be, if they're moving to the town, that may be what's the community offer, the area offer, but certainly within the, also within the, um, um, the, the realm of the work, what kind of things does that offer? How does that play into my needs, um, my family's needs? How does that all kind of work in my life, my work-life balance? All these things come in. So defining your opportunity is gonna be about unique selling points. We'll go into this a lot next week um, or the next session, yeah, next week. Um, and there's different, you know, we definitely wanna be thinking of the unique selling points because that's what you're trying to put in all your different communications about the ad, about the uh, opportunity. So a fully defined opportunity will help you understand your strengths and challenges. Because again, you wanna make sure that you know what your strengths are. You also wanna know what your challenges are. And we'll go, uh, like I said, there'll be another session all about that. Help define your ideal candidate. Um, because again, you gotta keep in mind when you're recruiting also, who is your ideal candidate? What, what, kind, of, what kind of background do they have? Not just you know, to fit the job, but also possibly to fit your community, to fit your organizational culture. So you wanna be thinking about the ideal candidate and you also wanna help um, understand why your opportunity is right for those candidates. So defining your opportunity is going to be a major part of this process as well. Um, these are some things you want to think about when you're defining your opportunity, community, culture, staff, facilities, compensation, all of those play a part in defining your opportunity. So it's just not about, okay, here's your salary, here's the job. You want, they want to know more than that. They want to know more about how this is going to impact my whole life how it's going to be a place that I could learn and grow and be participating in and feel like I'm at home there. So when you're thinking about that opportunity listing, um, that's why sometimes when we see people post a job description online as the job opening, we're like, oh man, that's, you know, we'll get to some more of that too. Um, compensation is always a challenge in rural areas, of course, especially. Um, and when you're talking about trying to compete against larger health facilities or systems, um, always a challenge, but we do have to remember that it's not all about the salary for candidates necessarily. Um, that is an important component, but it's really about the whole picture. Like we just talked about unique selling points. It could be the fact that, you know, it's not the money, but it's the fact that you're located close to um, something that they really like. You know, we're talking about the Delta region here. Perhaps they are an outdoor enthusiast. Maybe they would like going on rivers. You know, they, they have boating and they like fishing in rivers. Maybe that's something they really like to do and you have some of the best um, of that in your area. Um, perhaps they like being close to a larger city and you're within an hour or two, they don't wanna live in an, an urban area. So you have to kind of think about compensation as part of it. As long as you can be as competitive as you can be, I think that's something you always need to review and stay as close to the market as possible. Um, but it isn't the number one thing. And again, I think there's a lot of uh, things out there that will show you. Now, when it comes to you know, the, where this may play out differently is when it comes to like traveling people that are coming in, um, traveling nurses or traveling anybody that's going to come in like locum tenens, sometimes the money is the issue, right? Because they're not looking to establish a long-term relationship with you. So I think that, you know, where that may play out is that, you know, a lot of times those rates are set by any company that you work with. But generally, if you're trying to recruit somebody to come for work for you, stay with you, and that kind of thing, it's certainly something that you need to consider but, uh, but it's not something that should put you behind the eight ball that, you know, you'll never be able to find somebody because your salary is too low. If that's the case, then we need to keep looking harder for unique selling points for your organization because I think that we're missing something. Okay, so again, packaging your opportunity. Um, this is part of it is, you, is, is making sure that you understand your unique selling points and also how do you lay those out for your candidates to find? You know, if you're only posting a job in a local paper, you have a very small pool pool for candidates. If you're posting it on a job board, um, that's going to be different. And just because you don't maybe have the biggest marketing department doesn't mean you can't do some really cool things. Christine Morin, who's our marketing and communications director, is going to do part four of this session. And she's going to talk about a lot of cool resources that are free and low cost. 
So you want to package your opportunity to make it look as professional as possible. And again, there are a lot of things out there that can help you do that. Social media is a, is a real game changer. Anybody can participate in social media. Um, most of it is free. And if you can get some sharp people at your office or your hospital to help you with that, um, if you don't have somebody, if there's somebody in the community that can help you, uh, the local tourism, chambers of commerce, all those folks can help you really make your opportunities look professional and look uh, very well designed. And that's kind of the, the part, if you're gonna have a larger scale search than just local or folks that you already know, then you're gonna have to have really good um, way to communicate your strengths out there. And of course, all of this needs to be electronic now. Um, the days of when I first started recruiting in 1997, I'd mail packets of information out, right? That was the big thing. You mail out a brochure and we had all kinds of cool stuff. It was a whole FedEx pack we'd send out. Not anymore, not anymore. So hopefully you have all of um, that electronically. So that was kind of the planning and preparation. Let's go ahead and jump into part two. And this one, because of where we're gonna kind of do a breakout, I think we're gonna go ahead, we'll cover the first couple parts of this, but basically, Marketing to and finding candidates is, again, where often people will start this process. What we just went through, they didn't spend a lot of time through with or any. If you spend some time there, this will be a little bit easier because you're looking at how am I going to find these candidates? How am I going to reach them? And again, it depends on what profession you're looking for. If you're recruiting for nurses, you have one thing you're doing. If you're recruiting for lab techs, you're probably doing something else. But they are all kind of in the same realm. You're trying to get overall, get a, a cultural message, message across. So again, COVID changed this and the fact that, you know, because recruiting was so limited and so different for an extended period of time, the virtual handshake is now a very important part of the recruiting process. And the virtual handshake is, how am I gonna communicate with a candidate if they can't physically be here or if there's some restrictions in physically being here. And overall, that's how people are gonna find me anyway. Most likely candidates that are not already in your community or already working for you are going to find you from some other way. So virtually, how are we uh, going to accommodate that process? Are we using, can we have access to, whether it's Zoom or whatever you're, you're participating in here, um, how are we going to interview those candidates initially? Are we going to use it for our screening, for example? So there's a whole understanding of how we're going to reach out to these candidates um, virtually and understand how that kind of fits into your overall uh, process. So really, there's only one thing you want in a job ad, and we're going to go through this, and that's what matters to the candidate. Um, the candidate is driving this process, and you're trying to find what's going to be most appealing to them about you it's not, you're not telling them what you're not, you're telling them about you, but you just want to tell them about you in a way that puts you in the best um, light. So this is what you want in a job ad is what matters most to that candidate. And here's what a candidate's trying to look for when they're looking for a job. Again, this kind of goes back to what Mark was talking about. And we've talked about with, with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? These are candidate questions, belonging, fulfillment, esteem, prosperity. Am I the kind of person you're looking for? Am I going to fit? Am I going to fit your organization? Fulfillment. Does this fulfill my needs professionally? Will I be content there? Will I be engaged? Will, I be, will this be a good job and a good opportunity for me? Esteem. Will I be respected? How good of an employer are you? Are you really respected in your community and your area as a really good employer? Uh, will I be proud to work there? And prosperity. How do you treat your folks going forward? Are you always looking out for our best interest? Will I thrive? Will I make a good career for myself? Will my family be able to take care of um, all the you know, things they need to do? And these are basically the, um, the main questions we're looking for. This next slide is gonna show you a little bit more. How do you show that to candidates? Belonging. They love to see stories from your current staff who like working there and understand you know, the process. You know, we're looking for a motivated, mission-driven nurse that really is gonna fit into our organization that shows that I can belong there. You know, and then they hear from other folks that actually are showing me and you're telling me how they work together in a team. Fulfillment. Does this meet my career aspirations? My, you know, whether I'm a clinician or a, a lab person or a, even um, your, your billing, your uh, operations people, all of those folks, 
is this going to fulfill my need for um, you know working to the extent that I was trained for? Okay, so fulfillment. Um, am I going to make a difference, basically? And the esteem is there leadership opportunities. Um, our team is um, you know thrives around the culture. Uh, how do you how do you portray that in the marketing materials that you're putting out there? Are people telling them that when they come to visit your facility? Are they telling them about how wonderful it is to work for your operation? If it's not, um, we will go into that later some too about how do you how do you kind of change perceptions or how do you kind of look at things that may be uh, perceived as uh, challenges for your organization um, and offset them and and make sure that they understand that there's maybe something different uh, coming. So, and then prosperity. Uh, again, are you looking at the entire um, compensation structure, meaning not just pay, but uh, benefits and things like that? So um, this is where I think that we want to take a look at this. Um, the most in depth is, you know, how are we kind of looking at this and in, in, in fitting in and hiring folks that are that are going to match up? So I think this is where we wanted to keep a uh, opportunity to kind of do some breakout here and talk about the first. Uh, portion of this presentation. And I'm going to have you, Shannon, and, and uh, Caleb kind of go through the process of separating us out. And we can we can come back here and talk about both the team, unique selling points, the early parts of the job, and see how you guys feel about what we've said so far. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, so so this is the opportunity for you to, to share and hear from um, others in your, in the peer organizations in the Delta program. So um, Caleb just put a link in the chat to the handout one more time. So just an opportunity to think through these elements that Mike just talked about. So, so to think through um, how you currently address belonging, fulfillment, esteem, and prosperity in your um, communications with candidates. You know, what, do you, what do you have in there and what, what could you potentially include to really shore up, shore up what you're doing? So we're gonna put you in breakouts in just a minute. We'll ask you just to introduce yourself to those in your group. So what, just share your name and your location and then just talk through a little bit. How do you address each of these? You can learn from each other. You can give each other some, some guidance. We'll, we'll take 15 minutes in these groups and then we'll come back and kind of hear some highlights of what happened in the conversation. So again, we encourage you to take yourself off mute. If you're able to put yourself on video, that's, that's great also, but audio is probably the most important. So. Caleb, I think we are ready to move into breakout. Oh, and you may see some of us kind of popping in. So Mike and Mark and maybe me may pop in just to listen in a little bit because it's really helpful for us to hear um, what's going do, on. Do I need to stop sharing or not? Um, it doesn't matter. When they go into okay. breakouts, the sharing will stop. Okay. I think we're ready. Does anyone have highlights to share? Put it in the chat. You could unmute yourself. Were there some, some particularly good points that were made in your discussion? Um, well, I was um, in one of the rooms and I can just kind of summarize some of the comments from, from our room. Okay. Um, struggling with um, keeping, especially the younger generation of um, health professionals engaged and um, it, it seems like folks are coming and taking a job for a year or two years and then moving on. And we talked a lot about the cost of turnover of if we're losing somebody after a year, year and a half, how much does it cost us to go back and recruit that person again and try to re you know replace them? And it kind of was to Mike's first slide there is our recruitment process, you know, hire, train, you know, we get them all trained up with all of these resources and give them a really strong fundamental, um, you know, skill set, and then they leave, and then we're kind of back to square one um, again. So that was a lot of. Um, we talked again a lot about the generational differences in the workforce that I know Jen's going to cover later. Uh, cost of turnover. I mentioned to them. I think I can track down a cost of turnover calculator that I'll throw in the chat box um, that that can help. Um, that can help give you a dollar amount as far as what the cost of turnover is. And then, you know, how do we continue to incentivize through obligations or through, um, you know, contract structures? How can we kind of incentivize those employees to stay longer? Thanks, Mark. That's great. And yeah, perfect timing to have Jennifer here today with us. Anyone else? 
Any from the any highlights from the other group? Mike or anybody else who was in that group? What was the conversation? Where did what direction did it take? Uh, I, I don't want to speak for the group, but I do. Uh, <laughs> it was basically the same. It's very, um, very apparent that uh, folks are trying everything that they can think of to keep staffed. Um, it is very challenging right now, and a lot of, especially you know, a lot of, a lot of the uh, different job descriptions they have and types. Um, people leaving for you know anywhere from twenty five cents an hour to ten bucks an hour, um, but also also seeing people you know leave those things after. A short while understanding that maybe it wasn't a good fit um and figuring out how to um you know do some things that maybe more about the sorry about that um looking at the um unique selling points that was that came up is that you know how do you how do you sell the overall package not just here's the job we have at this small place or this or this hospital you know what is what is your life going to be like if you live here instead of just the job you know and trying to be a little bit more uh, you know, uh, thoughtful about that. And also hopefully, um, again, using Christine's presentation here in a couple of weeks with free and low cost resources to expand your reach um, of your of your job to, to different places. So that's definitely something that I think that will be helpful. Um, I wish we had easy answers. Again, Jen was in our session too, generationally. Uh, we got to figure, we kept saying some, people are going to have to go back to work eventually, but um, there, are, there are a lot of um, you know, uh, restaurants closing down uh, in towns that, that just they're closed because they don't have staff. And um, so, so at some point, people are going to have to come back to work. But right now it's challenging. Very much so. Thanks, Mike. Any other any other highlights that any of the rest of you would like to share? Okay, well, I don't, I, I know, that, as Mike said, there are no easy answers. Hopefully it's helpful just to talk with others, even if nothing else, just to find out that you're not alone in your challenges. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and and as Mike said, the rest of these, the series will just provide some additional resources and, you know, things that can, that can help you kind of get a leg up on some of these challenges. So thanks. Mike, I'll turn it back over to you. And I see that Mark just put in the chat a link to the cost of turnover tool. So thanks, Mark. Okay, is everybody still seeing mine? It's looking a little weird on my end. Is that okay, Dice? You're still seeing the slides okay? We are, I'm just seeing you. You have to share your screen again. Okay, because I lost my controls. That's what I was trying to figure out. Where'd my controls oh, Caleb, be? can you, is there something on your end you do? I'm not really quite sure what I did. Are you able to see that? Green? Okay, now, okay, now I got it back, I think, here. Sorry about that. Okay, thanks, Caleb. Okay, am I back? You're back. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we'll go through this last half kind of um, in, in there's, there's a lot of stuff to cover, but again, we'll give you some of the highlights here. We were talking about uh, job ads or the job description. And again, a lot of you were taking away from there. Here's some things that you could possibly do make sure that these are very visual, make sure that they're mobile friendly. You wanna make sure that you can do as much interactive as possible with your job descriptions, linking it to videos from staff, things like that. Some of you had some good ideas on that or at least attempting some things. And again, I think when we get to some of the free and low cost resources, I think that'll help with this as well. But just remember that you're, uh, as, as Jen's gonna talk about, we're talking to different generations uh, when you're recruiting, you're talking from generations, but what three or four different generational sets. And um, everybody kind of looks at things differently. So you're gonna have to make sure that your job ads and how you're presenting yourself also is represented in that as well. So make sure you make it visual. Uh, job ad like this will turn anybody off. I think you would be as well, if this is your job description and this is what you're putting out there, um, you'll know what we're talking about because this is, uh, nobody's gonna read this uh, anymore. Not the, way, not the way they used to. This might be a little bit better. Uh, you can see it kind of cut down some of that heavy text, got some links in it has a, uh, you know, even a graphic there, some bullet points. Um, remember, we're, we're, people are used to reading online now. They're not used to reading um, log, like classified ad type things from a newspaper where they used to maybe look for jobs. They're looking online. So, you, so your job postings and ads and, and opportunities need to be reflective of that as well. So just keep that in mind as we go through all this as well. Um, where you source matters. Again, if you're trying to find newer candidates, like right out of school, 
you need to look for certain places and post ads in certain places. If you're looking for people that are on the other end of their career, they're perhaps career changers or even toward the end of their career, where are you going to find them? So where you source does matter. Um, and you may have different strategies for different positions, uh, depending on what your ideal candidate may look for. So try to make sure you think about all your different sourcing avenues, again, by, pos by position and also just by the group you're looking for. So here's some of the things that we think are working. And again, with COVID, you, we're, you're trying all these. Online job boards, you're all on online job boards, virtual job fairs, in-person job fairs, if they're still existent and if you've had any. Um, somebody in our breakout room just said they had a great job fair well put together, a whole bunch of staff there to talk to people, five people showed up. And most of them were um, later in career folks that were just looking for maybe part-time work. So um, job fairs though still are out there and virtual job fairs are gaining attraction as well. If you haven't tried one of those yet, those are out there definitely. Employee referrals, we're gonna to touch on this even more. This used to be and still is probably one of the strongest way, ways to find new candidates. Uh, but again, if people aren't simply in the workforce, it's still a, a challenge. But employee referrals is definitely something that you want to uh, have part as you know part of the arsenal in your toolkit. Networking and then specialty advertising. Just you know, if you know a specific um, type of profession you're looking for, if they have a um, a job board for that, or if they have some way you can target that directly. Here's a few examples of of uh, job boards. Now a lot of these are uh, focused mainly on maybe physicians or nurse practitioners. Now 3Rnet, you know, we have every, we have postings of all different kinds on 3Rnet. Indeed, Monster, those are obviously huge and can cover all kinds of different um, um, professions. So these are just a few that we kind of wanted to throw out there and have you think about. Employee referral program. If you don't have one or check, take a look at how it is set up. If it hasn't, if it's been a while, if you've had one for a while and it hasn't been kind of updated in a while, take a look at it. Um, Maybe the dollar amount could be done differently. Um, the referral bonuses, again, if you already have that, um, make sure the referring employee knows there's any negative consequences if it doesn't work out. In other words, it's not their fault. If somebody leaves after three months, they're not gonna get a ding for that. Make sure it's you know that you're really trying to encourage um, and creating an environment that naturally has people wanting to refer uh, your organization to friends and colleagues and, uh, and fellow professionals. Uh, and leverage social media. Um, this is a way that you know uh, your your employees are on social media. They're on all different types of social media. Uh, the more that you can let them share things about your organization and about job opportunities that you have on social media, um, the better opportunity you have for reaching an even wider audience. And again, remember, social media is for the most part free. Uh, you can boost your post and things like that for, for low cost. So it's definitely one of those resources we're going to be going through. Okay, so matching and committing is basically more of the HR process here. Um, we, you, you definitely probably know more about this than any section. So I'm not going to go through this a whole lot. Um, Behavior-based are, are basically the types of questions that you're probably going to see. Um, right now, the question is, are you doing it virtually or in person, depending where you are and where you're recruiting people from? Uh, if you happen to be recruiting, if you're in a state that's pretty open right now, like I am in Missouri, but I'm recruiting somebody from, you know, possibly like even the East Coast, um, they're not going to feel extremely comfortable coming to visit right now yet. There's still a lot of restrictions and still a lot of travel issues uh, that they're dealing with. So we got to remember that right now um, we're kind of all on a different, um, you know, kind of a different step in the process where we are. So just keep that in mind as you're, you're talking to candidates. Where are they from? What has their experience been with COVID? How comfortable are they coming to visit? Are you going to need to do this virtually? If they need to do it virtually, how set up are you to, to handle that? Do you have your teams ready to do virtual interviews and all that kind of thing? So you definitely want to make sure that you're thinking through that process as you're recruiting. Um, you also want to make sure here, um, one of the things we're going to touch on is, is how are you interviewing or talking to the spouse slash partner? One of the most important parts of recruiting is that dynamic and we'll touch on that in just a minute. And also I always wanna throw this in too, be prepared for negotiations. If you're recruiting um, a new, again, physician or nurse practitioner or somebody that's a clinician or even some of your senior management, um, who's, who's negotiating this process? Is there a contract already in place if it's gonna be a contract position? Um, is it ready to go? Don't slow down the process by having your own process not ready. So in other words, if you're out there recruiting be ready to hire somebody fairly quickly if you find the right person. And that goes in all professions. Everything you're recruiting for, make sure that your, your processes don't slow it down. I've seen that happen before 
or the, the hospital attorney throws a wrench in something that looked like it was already done or, or should be done because of something that wasn't talked about before. So make sure that your processes are in place and also who's negotiating those contracts and who's negotiating those opportunities. So here's some different ways you can do interviewing. <coughs> of course, um, many of you are familiar with. Again, we'll get more into uh, some of this down the road, but you know, behavioral-based interviews is probably where we think you're gonna be spending the most time and this is why um, past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. Um, obviously it's not a new concept. This has been around for a while. It can also minimize the halo effect and subjectivity, that halo effect, meaning you see somebody, you know, that um, because they're really uh, good in one area, it kind of clouds your whole judgment of them in another area, or perhaps you saw a negative thing in one area and it kind of affects the whole thing. Behavior-based interviewing can take some of that out of there. Um, and this is where you're trying to find also collect meaningful information for the cultural fit for your organization. Behavioral-based interviewing can help you get to that a lot better. And here's some of those questions that you want to try to do, right? Open-ended questions. Uh, there are no magic ones. The frequently used starters are tell me about a time. Describe for me. Give me an example of you're trying to get real life information from them on how they interacted with their, their past employers, how they, uh, or if they were at school, you know, how they did their, their work, how they approach things, how is that going to play out in your organization? Uh, bottom line, you need specific examples of kind of what their work experience has been and, and how have they taken action to get the results that they have through their work. So, um, Again, we could spend obviously a lot longer time on this, but just make sure that you have this process really kind of buttoned up. Same thing then with what we also consider probably one of the bigger strategies that 3 net promotes, and that is the interview or interaction with the spouse partner. We know that from research that the retention rate of folks is dramatically affected by probably two big things, spousal satisfaction or partner satisfaction and um, leadership the leadership of the organization. Those are two things that are always gonna come back in any kind of survey of people leaving. So you wanna to try to think about this and be thoughtful about this on the front end. Is the person that you're recruiting or trying to bring into position also have a spouse, partner, family that's gonna be coming with them if they're not from your area and how are they going to uh, be uh, acclimated or accommodated in kind of the, the community. So having somebody that is part of your organization that's very well, very well connected in your community that knows a lot of people, that can answer a lot of questions on their own, who also somebody you can kind of work with so that they understand what your goals are in this, that you're trying to um, basically just find out what this um, person needs and what they're, you know, how, what's going to keep them maybe happy in, uh, in this area. If their spouse slash partner is working for you, what are they going to be doing? Do they need a job? What kind of job? Kids, all that kind of thing. So these are the types of things you want to gather on the information. <coughs> um, and again, a lot of that can be done through just an informal kind of dialogue with them about saying, hey, I know you're coming or that if they're there on site. Sometimes you can set a separate itinerary and that kind of thing. So you definitely want to spend some time on this. We also feel this is one of the concept kind of in a rural area when you talk about culture that really kind of makes a difference sometimes because I don't know if all larger facilities are in a bigger town. This is quite the same level of uh, necessary uh, information. But certainly when you're recruiting to a smaller area, it's, it's, it's a bigger part of it. So that's kind of the matching and commitment, which is part three. And then part four is just some of your lifetime, um, your life cycle employee uh, tactics, uh, techniques. And we're going to touch on a few of these here. There will be several discussed, but uh, we'll touch on a few. So retention success is possible in any geographic location. People sometimes don't believe that, but um, you got to believe that, you know, you still are in the area that you're working in. Um, and if that's, you feel like that's not a desirable area, well, it is for you. You know, you have stayed. So retention is possible in any geographic area. It's not about the geographic area. It's usually about, again, the other factors that in fact impact the employment. Um, retention starts in recruitment. Again, when you start this retention process or from your first interaction with a candidate all the way through hire, all the way through their whole life cycle with you should be that process of trying to figure out how to keep them motivated and engaged with your organization. And it certainly starts with um, upfront at the recruitment process. It's also about a good fit. You know, you can't make somebody work for you if they don't fit. Um, and, and again, right now, it's hard to find anybody to work for you, right? It's hard enough just to find people. And it's certainly hard if, if they don't feel like they fit in, if they don't feel like the job doesn't fit them. Um, so you really want to make sure you spend a lot of time on that upfront um, 
getting through that kind of information and, and understanding that. And again, no one stays in a bad job. Uh, leadership, um, Jennifer touched on, I think, in our breakout session about how it's important the manager's role in success of this is. So certainly we want to keep um, that in mind as well. So here's some of just the retention strategies. A couple we'll touch on. Uh, onboarding, engagement, stay interviews, we'll touch on that one. Succession planning, staffing needs. The work-life balance is certainly something that everybody talks about and, and knows some about, but be, you know, spending some time on that. Compensation surveys, total compensation statements, and, and unique benefits. Again, how can you create different opportunities here? So those are some of the strategies that we usually talk about. Onboarding is one of the probably uh, I think it's been coming, you know, it's certainly more common now, this whole process than it was maybe, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, but still spend some time on this because every new employee needs to feel like they've been welcomed. They need to understand their role. Um, they need to know how to do their day-to-day -day job, but they also need to know what's the insider stuff. How do they, you know, all those little things that, that go into the culture of your organization. Those are things that they need to know about. And the better you can do that, the more uh, opportunity you have to retain them for a longer time. And here's some of the things that they need to know. You know, research shows that these four um, areas are, are things that an onboarding program is trying to accomplish: role clarity, uh, self-efficacy, social acceptance, and knowledge. So all of those things are what you're trying to aim for in your onboarding program. Um, and again, onboarding is very difficult when you're also staff, you know, small staff. But again, that's where a team comes in. Um, if you have a recruitment for retention team, onboarding and that whole process should be included in this is how are you going to welcome and, and bring in new folks? And that's why your team has to be pretty substantially sized. Stay interviews are, are, are kind of a management technique that uh, Michelle talks a lot about when she does our presentations. Um, she's a big believer in this, again, because, again, poor, le poor leadership causes over 60% of all employee turnover. So stay interviews are just a kind of a... a a way to establish trust between a manager and their direct reports, um, a little bit more structured, but not very structured either, like a performance review. It's somewhere in between um, and certainly something that if you aren't doing or having your managers do, it would be a great uh, tool for you to maybe help keep them engaged with your staff and keep understanding issues. Some of the guidelines for a stay interview, always do them in person. Try to set some ex expectations for them, what you're trying to talk about. Plan the conversation, make sure that you're getting feedback from them the way you should. And then you're basically trying to ask questions and find out how things are going with them. Just like you would sitting down with a friend over coffee, you'd be asking questions and trying to find out how their life is going. And it's not dissimilar here, I don't think, with a stay interview. You're just trying to make sure that you are communicating your concern to you, the people you work for, and understanding that you're trying to get the issues out on the table so that they can be addressed and not fester. So stay interviews are a great technique for retention that you'll want to kind of look at. And lastly here, work-life balance. It's, it's very, uh, it's kind of a almost overused term now, work-life balance, but what it basically means is how does my life work around and with my job, okay? Um, do I have enough time off to enjoy the hobbies and things I do? Um, does work sponsor things or give me opportunities for social interaction? Some people will take advantage of those. Other people don't. There's, we know there's staff people that I don't want to be around people after work. Other people, they would love to be in that. So how do you communicate that you're available to both types of folks? Those that, you know, are 40 hours a week and I'm done, I'm off on my own stuff, but they may want to make sure they have time off for their hobbies and things. Others, they'd like to have more time, you know, interaction outside of work with the people they work with. So they get to know them better. They feel even more acclimated. Both types are fine. And you got to kind of make sure you know which, where, where people fit in on that. And again, trying to keep your employees healthy. Well, all those things we, we definitely want to do. So. Okay, so questions were there, and um, I know we're going to take a little bit of time here, um, I think, before Jennifer. And um, I certainly think you can take questions now, we're going to take questions at the end, Shannon, however you want to. Let's just, let's just take a minute to offer the opportunity now. Okay. Does anybody have a question for Mike? You can put it in the chat, or feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, so thank you again for uh, inviting me to participate today. So hopefully um, what I'm giving you are some good nuggets that, uh, or just really good takeaways that will uh, marry into uh, what Mike just talked about. Um, recruitment and retention, um, I think especially in today's world is extremely difficult. 
Um, you know, I live in a tourist town, um, so everyone is leaving where they live and coming here, but we are also having um, a lot of those same issues where, you know, restaurants and stores are closing for entire days because they just don't have staffing. So um, hopefully uh, I can share with you some information on the different demographics through generations that will assist you while you are looking at creative ways to um, even highlight the uniqueness at your employer so that as you're looking to staff and recruit, ultimately leading to retention, uh, you know, that, that we can be of assistance. So we're gonna talk a little bit about facts, uh, most of which, uh, you know, are just some, uh, some, some stats that I had found um, through my research, uh, most of which still rings true. Um, as you can imagine, there's not a lot of statistics out there right now on, um, uh, you know, on 2020 and the, de and the demographics in the workplace, um, but we're gonna do the best we can. And we're gonna talk about relationships and relating to your teams uh, and the different generations. We're gonna talk about recruitment. Um, and then I'm not necessarily gonna touch on retention, but I just want you to see how uh, how these things obviously relate into how do we retain these individuals. So just for a visual, I'm going to focus primarily on these four generational types. Um, our traditionalists really have found their way out of the workforce. Uh, and so really what we're seeing uh, is the majority are baby boomers, Gen Xers, Gen Yers, and Gen Zers. Uh, and so for the most part, again, that Gen Y, Gen Z uh, is where we're seeing the majority of our workforce. We'll talk a little bit more about stats here in just a minute, but these are always fun to go through. Uh, and so as you're looking through this, be thinking not only about yourself, where do you fall, but where does your team fall? Where does your manager fall? Um, and this may help you relate a little bit. So um, I'll just talk about myself personally. I'm in the Gen Z realm. And so I grew up on MTV, Nintendo, uh, you know, PCs were big in high school. Uh, you know, I remember doing my resume on a typewriter. Uh, so we didn't have uh, a lot of a lot of the um, uh, the, the nice, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft. We didn't have any of that back then. Um, and at least if we did, I was uh, raised very inner city in Columbus, Ohio. And so those things weren't available to me. Um, so thinking rural as well, those are probably some of the, the, um, the things that you may have dealt with. Uh, work is a difficult challenge. Work-life balance, we've talked about. Independence is also something uh, that we look for. Um, changing jobs, again, if necessary for compensation. This is a thread that we've been talking about. And even in our breakout group, as Mike had said, this was something, um, you know, people, can, people will leave for 25 cents. Uh, and then come back three months later and be looking for an additional 25 cent raise. So compensation, because a lot of the individuals in this, um, in this age group not only have children maybe that are graduating, but they have aging parents. And so you're also dealing with um, financial burdens from many different areas in life. Uh, career paths, we've probably already chosen our career path or uh, what I'm finding now, and you may even be experiencing this, is that there are a lot of individuals that maybe had hit this Gen X spot uh, and through COVID have decided, I want to change my career. Um, and so we've seen some folks leave healthcare. Uh, and maybe they'll come back. Um, but, you know, there's some definite job changing. Um, people are looking for ways to work online. Uh, we can't necessarily put that elephant back in the box now. Uh, we have let people see that you can actually function and function well working remotely. Uh, so those are some of the things too that you may see um, people are looking for our, our flexibility and, and ways to work from home. Um, money, uh, you know, most of us in this Gen X are looking on ways to save, save, save. Um, so I just, I, I provided these slide, the slide deck to you. I just encourage you to read it. Um, again, not really depend, knowing where everyone falls, but one thing that I find interesting is, depending on your research, the dates may change a little bit. Um, but I'm hearing more consistently, people definitely are, are bringing to light that, you know, all you've heard for many years is, oh, the millennials, the millennials, this, the millennials, that. Guys, they're 40. <laughs> Some of them are 40. We can no longer do that. We have to take a step back and say, all right, how can, how can we help uh, make positive change in our workforce and not necessarily continue to just 
point the finger. So looking at our millennials, right, they've dealt with natural disasters. Everyone currently on this board has um, dealt with the pandemic. So I, that I didn't include because that's across the board. Um, but diversity is definitely something that has been really, really big um, in, in that age group. Mobile technology, having a computer at your fingertips. Um, funny enough, uh, you know, my daughter's in uh, the sixth grade and, uh, you know, was was so frustrated at some of the math that they had to do. And I said, back when I was younger, uh, you know, our teachers would say, you're not going to have a calculator at your fingertips at all times. Well, I beg to differ. Um, I do. And so just thinking through, you know, sometimes we have to make some changes and create different ways and or allow people to arrive at a decision in a different way because technology was much, uh, much more prevalent for the Gen Y or specifically our Gen Zers. Uh, moving into, into today. They're looking for freedom and flexibility. Um, job change is to be expected. Uh, you know, they're still figuring things out. Uh, there's lots of opportunities, so they may be uh, moving. There's lots of um, online, uh, not only online jobs, but we're finding that a lot of our, our Ys and our Zs are entrepreneurial, and so they may be creating multiple uh, income streams and so they might be looking for more of a part-time opportunity versus a full-time and or if you're able um, to provide them with that uh, you may see you know if you're looking for a full-timer maybe you need two part-timers so just trying to think through that um, they're earning money to spend right uh, many of them may not have necessarily settled down uh, and so you know money is uh, dispensable to them our Gen Zers consistently evolving. They're looking for uh, structure and stability. A lot of this is because many of our Gen Zers, and if you have a Gen Zer, close your ears, but many of our Gen Zers um, have had a lot of things handed to them. And so everything, again, has been at their fingertips and, and um, working hard sometimes um, isn't something that they've necessarily been used to. So um, it might take a little more training um, so in our Gen Zers, be looking for um, attitude. Uh, if you can teach skill, uh, I always tell people teach skill. Um, and some of you may have ha ran into this. I've even ran into this uh, with some Gen Yers, but um, you may have had the question, especially, you know, hey, I just got hired. Can I bring my parent to orientation? Um, thinking through whether or not that's something that you're willing or able to do and or is there some information you can send home with them uh, so that they can talk to um, their parents because some of them are younger still living at home um, still learning about life uh, and you know maybe just finishing college or depending on the positions that you're hiring for they may still be in college and or uh, you know not not in school and still living with a parent. Some of what we're finding too right now, especially in today's day and age, is, is many people have downsized and are living together. So um, I know many siblings, especially here in this area, um, we have many families because there's just no houses. There's no rental, there's no rentals available. And so people have downsized. Um, therefore, that also, uh, you know, does not help us in the market um, because someone may not need to work as much because their financial situation for their family may have changed. So again, this information is for um, is for you. There's a lot of really fun information out there if you're ever looking for uh, an opportunity to uh, to learn more about this. I, I did find this information and um, put my own spin on it because again, there's not a lot of stats out there right now because 2020 was a bit of an anomaly. Um, in comparison to years earlier. But according to the Census Bureau, this is what it's going to look like in 2025. If we look here to the right on this picture, boomers are going to be about 18 uh, percent. And actually, I beg to differ that that may actually be a lot less just because many folks have retired through this last year. Um, Gen Xers about 21 percent. Our millennials are going to make up the majority of our workforce. And then our Gen Zers, you'll see in 2025, are going to start creeping up. Um, so again, not a lot of information available from, um, from 2020. But what I will say is that you'll see that the boomers, um, you know, for sure are starting to retire. So we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, but what we're also seeing is that those Gen Zers are probably going to be about 10 percent 
of our current workforce, depending on um, what it is that is available out there. Um, so if you have positions where you're able to create a training program for them, if it's a non-licensed um, or a non-degree required position, you might be able to um, um, benefit from, you know, developing your own training programs and or if you're close to a college linking arms with them or a trade school to see how you can work together in order to um, help increase uh, some individuals that are, you know, looking for jobs. So um, I want, I, I wanted to just kind of give you an opportunity to just kind of picture yourself at the dinner table. So I don't know about you, but I'm from the Midwest. And for us, Thanksgiving was always a big holiday that our family got together. So picture yourself around the Thanksgiving dinner table. Um, we had a kid table <laughs> growing up. So we naturally were segregated by our generation just based off of where you sat. Uh, we also had a large family. So Usually, um, the older generation was cooking, uh, the, the middle generation, which at that point would have been like in our current realm, the Gen Zers. So that let's say the boomers are in there cooking, the Gen Zers are the ones setting the table, maybe you're the one that brought the plastic ware, uh, you know, or a side dish. Uh, but everyone had a different role. And, and so some, sometimes, especially with our older generation, the expectation is that, um, that they are going to provide more of that direction. Um, that can cause a little bit of issue in a workplace environment because they may have this expectation that um, they're the ones driving things that are happening at work. However, um, based on your organization and, and your culture, they may have a younger boss. Um, so how do you work with those individuals to make sure that they're able to work together um, because some of those differences can, uh, can cause a little bit of um, conflict within the workplace. And then you have our Gen Zers that are coming in, right, that finally want a seat at the table because they're no longer a kid, they're over 18, and that makes a huge difference. Um, Relationship-wise, you know, really what I want you to kind of think of is now more than ever, the relationships you have with your team will directly affect, and you can probably hear, somebody just rang the doorbell, so my dogs are going crazy. Um, how you relate to one another, how we build relationships, how we find common ground, um, how can we be open to learning new ideas and new ways? So through COVID, I also became a fourth grade teacher uh, unexpectedly, and I really didn't plan on, I'm not a great elementary school teacher. Um, so part of the challenge there was I had to teach my daughter because she was working, she was going to school remotely. If any of you have any children uh, and you had children during that time, you probably experienced the same thing. Um, I had to learn how to do common core math. Um, because where I came from, we carried the one <laughs> when we did uh, subtraction. We, we didn't do that uh, in Common Core Math. And so that was something that I had to learn and something that I had to be prepared to teach her um, because that was not something that I was familiar with. So being uh, open to learning new ways and new ideas that those who are different in the workplace and maybe older or younger can teach you. Um, respecting those that came before you, um, that's huge with our boomers right now was definitely something really big with our traditionalists. Uh, we, we came into the situation where it was, you know, we have, um, we have individuals that have done it the same way and it works. Uh, and there was this fear in the workplace that if I teach you what I know, you are no, I'm no longer gonna be relevant in the workplace. And so I think we've done a really good job um, just generally and helping f fill some of those gaps. Um, but again, us being open to learning those new things, respecting those that came before us and really just finding what works best for others and that it's okay for someone to arrive at an answer without going the same route maybe that other generations have gone. So here are some things to consider when you're looking at generations. Um, you may fall within two generations. Uh, most of this could be um, characterized because maybe your parents were older when they had you, uh, or maybe 
uh, your parents were really, really young. Uh, maybe grandparents raised you. Um, so if they are in a generation that's not naturally that next step generation, you may have tendencies that are going to fall more in line with a generation that is older than the one that you technically fall in based off of your age range. Um, my age range and my birth date, uh, I'm really kind of teetered between the X and the Y. Uh, and so I can see where there are some uh, the, there are some ways that I may fall more into the X and some ways that I may fall more into the Y. Um, again, a lot of this is just relational um, and you'll, you'll see as you look in here uh, that, that things will, will start to add up for you. Your parents and your childhood mattered. Um, again, uh, you may have you may you may have characteristics of a different generation. Personality types or interests are also going to play a factor here. Um, everything that I, I, I have found, uh, you have to take that into consideration because it's not only um, where you fall generationally, but it's also where you were raised uh, and what your personality types it is and or what your interests are. All of these things are very, very helpful during the recruitment process. You want to make sure that you're asking as many questions as possible. Ask the non-traditional, what do you like to do outside of work? Uh, you know, if you know that they have a spouse and children, are they in any extracurricular activities? Can you relate to any of those things? Is there anyone on your staff that can relate to those things? Especially, um, you know, just thinking through physician recruitment. These were for sure some of those questions that, um, that I asked because I wanted to make sure that I was including those individuals. And if we were bringing them into town, if, I, if they liked fly fishing, uh, I'm going to use this mic because I've seen it on one of your slides, but if they like fly fishing, I'm going to find someone on my team or someone in the community that enjoys that and I'm going to, to, to try to connect them uh, so that they can see that. If you know that they attend their local church and they're going to need to find a church, do some research and take them around a couple different places while they're in town. Uh, you know, show them the local, uh, the baseball fields if, if maybe baseball is something that they're interested in. Ask those questions. Um, you'll, you'll be surprised at how much that one is gonna make them feel a little bit more comfortable. And two, um, how much that is going to um, assist you in, in identifying what that next step is gonna be for them. So how do we recruit across uh, generations, right? Number one, you need to identify who you're trying to reach. Um, baby boomers may want to share from their knowledge and experience to try promoting ways that they can contribute to the growth of the organization. Our Gen Xers are going to be focused on building their careers. So what are your career growth opportunities? Do you have internal training, professional development? Um, again, have you linked with the local college where you can help provide resources? Are they a medical assistant and they would love to be an RN? Um, do you have a career path that will allow them to do that? And or um, do you have an opportunity um, financially to assist them in the burden that they may have uh, you know, in going to school, especially in many remote um, rural areas, lots of individuals, that's one thing, um, at least through my research and through my personal experience, um, you know, my family was very um, uh, um, urban and we didn't have a lot of money. So we were lower, lower middle class and going to college was never an option for me, um, at least financially through my parents. And so um, providing folks an opportunity to do that uh, and, and encouraging them may be something that they haven't received before. That's also going to provide some retention opportunity for you for those individuals too. So millennials are going to tend to be more socially conscious. So promote work culture, company ethics, um, opportunities for volunteering. We talked about ways that folks maybe can get together after work hours. Uh, you know, ways to do that in a, in a healthy uh, atmosphere could be, uh, are there organizations locally that you um, partner with to do some volunteer opportunities? Um, you know, are there some uh, departments within your organization if you work for a hospital, uh, do you have a pediatric uh, department maybe that could be cheered up with balloons or a party or, you know, how can you encourage people to develop committees? These are some of the things that our younger generations are going to be looking for. Uh, but people from all generations are mobile. Uh, like Mike said, no one uses a, at least from my, um, you know, at least locally here, 
there's no longer uh, an opportunity really for you to walk in and say, can I fill out an application? Everything is, uh, everything is mobile. Uh, so make sure that one, those mobile options are clear. They're easy to find. Um, and that, that first initial application process um, is not 50 pages long with several questions that are difficult for folks to answer um, because you have a multitude of generations that could potentially be applying. And so just making sure that you have created um, things at a literacy level that make it easy for anyone to, uh, to apply and to assist. Okay, so we're gonna look at this again, uh, primary generations in the workplace. I'm gonna go down through um, our four main generations and talk a little bit about some ways that you can uh, improve your recruitment process that if you're looking to um, hire within this demographic, uh, maybe of assistance. So what are our baby boomers looking for? Uh, we talked about flexible hours, right? Many of them are not retiring at 65 anymore. Uh, this could be uh, due to a multitude of, of different um, reasons, right? Maybe they want flexible hours. So maybe they want part-time and or depending on their position, they may, um, be interested in uh, just being on call. Stability, they wanna feel secure in their role as they approach retirement. Healthcare benefits are also gonna be something extremely uh, important to these individuals. Again, these are our folks that are aging into the, the last, uh, you know, we'll say 40 years of their life. Um, and so they're gonna be looking for benefits to help them through some of those things that start to pop up. Um, I'm well into my 40s and it's, it's amazing how uh, some of the things that I used to be able to do, I can no longer do. And there are a lot of things, uh, depending on your age group that you are required to have on an annual basis. Um, and so, you know, being able to provide healthcare benefits to them and their family members is gonna also be huge. What are some recruiting uh, tactics for you? Again, thinking through that digital universe, uh, being able to do Many of them are Zooming, um, so that's typically not an issue. Uh, most of them have smartphones uh, because, especially our, uh, the younger folks on this um, uh, on this slide, uh, are going to have that. I know my parents fall within this age group, and we use uh, Zoom a lot, and so it's it's actually a downloaded app on their phone. And so through COVID, I think that has sped up. Uh, the requirement for technology for these individuals just to keep them connected with life. Um, traditionally, uh, or traditional is still a strong influence, consider their history of offline media. And so, um, you know, they still enjoy, uh, I still even enjoy getting cards in the mail or getting a thank you note or getting a letter or, you know, sending something um, tangible that they can hold is still important to them. And just get to the point, many of them just, you know, they want to know the specifics. They want to, um, you know, make sure that if it's something that they're going to need training for, what are those details? When does it need to happen? Um, uh, you know, and so not really kind of beating around the bush for them is going to be helpful. Moving into our Gen Xers, um, what are they looking for in a company? Growth opportunities and consistency. At this stage in their career, they're looking for growth. They want to be a contributor. Uh, they want to feel like they're a part of um, Work-life balance also shows up again. Uh, this is time off work. I currently am figuring out um, my daughter made the middle school dance team and it is more work than I had ever anticipated. Um, my sons were very active in baseball. Uh, and so, you know, making sure that um, these individuals have that opportunity to participate in those things is extremely important. Um, stability and company values, they're at that point in their career where they wanna be there. Um, moving around, um, it, it's just, uh, it's not necessary unless there are some internal or cultural reasons. Um, they are really looking for that stability and company that has values and are looking to keep them and looking for ways to retain them. Training and development is also important. Folks in this generation are going to be looking for professional development. So if you're able to provide that to them, um, like utilizing 3RNet and other organizations, there's a lot of information out there online. Um, there's a lot that can be obtained um, online as well. Uh, mentoring programs, um, getting these individuals involved as, as a mentor. Uh, so if you're looking at your Gen Zers that are coming in and you're looking for someone to connect them with um, that is well embedded in your organization and can be, um, uh, you know, 
again, looking for individuals who are healthy uh, and that would be a good role model is, is, is who you're gonna wanna link them to in this, in this age group. Um, strong benefit package, again, um, these individuals may also be experiencing the aging parent. Uh, and so being able to provide them with um, time off opportunities to handle those life situations that pop up uh, will be important as well as they may also have young children. Um, so they're that in between generation right now that are, are dealing with um, several different challenges. Um, formal career path development. Uh, if this isn't something that you currently have in the works, uh, this is also a generation that you can task with assisting to create something like that. Um, because they have a well-versed knowledge of what's out there in the in the community. Uh, you know, they're still totally fine with picking up the phone and having a conversation. Not everything is by text uh, and going and having meetings. And so this is definitely a generation you want to task with that. Digital savvy, for sure, recruitment tactics, um, texting, video calls, um, sending a video and saying, hey, it was so great to meet you. So looking forward to the next step. Um, that's also a really great way to connect with this group, um, providing that um, it is personal. Um, so again, hey, Shannon, it was so great to meet you. Uh, so looking forward to that next conversation with you. Make sure you do one, two, three, and we'll chat next week. Um, so even doing a video or a voice call uh, through text, something of that nature, um, I have found has also been um, very highly received. Um, promote the combination of culture and day-to-day. -day. So this really looking through um, these are the individuals that are going to pick, a pulp, pick apart your culture. If you haven't already created what you want your culture to look like for your organization, they're likely going to be a huge part of defining it for you. Um, so making sure as an organization that you, one, have already predetermined what that is, uh, and two, that you're utilizing these individuals to help um, navigate that and trickle that down and cascade that down into the different departments because lots of individuals in this Gen X realm are your managers. They're your midline managers. They could even be your senior directors. Um, so making sure that you're pouring back into them at that leadership level is going to be huge. So if you're recruiting someone into this position, they may be looking for that, that natural hierarchy of what's the next step and or what uh, training and development um, am I going to be able to participate in if it is a succession planning opportunity. If I'm coming in as a director but know my next step is the senior VP, um, am I working with that individual to learn the ropes, um, you know, or uh, is that even an opportunity for me? So knowing those things because those are possibly some questions that you're going to receive um, from our Gen Xers as they're coming through uh, your recruitment path. So finally, our wires, uh, I'm sorry, not finally, but our wires and our, our millennials, um, again, this is to 24 to 40. Uh, and so some of these individuals are still trying to figure things out. They're looking for growth opportunities. Don't hold it against them if you ask where they want to be in five years and they say your position or the CEO. Um, this is just the way they think. Uh, you know, again, lots of entrepreneurship happening in this age group. And so we want to be sure um, that this uh, is what we're making available to them. Have fun with it, uh, you know, and if they say that and, and their, their resume doesn't line up to it, ask what their next steps are. Are they, are they still considering school or what kind of training are they looking for? Um, uh, lots of individuals in this age group have been trained to say certain things. Uh, and those things may not necessarily hold true for your organization or be a question that you've been asked before. So feel free to banter back and forth and, and ask some good questions when they may say something that's a little bit off the cuff, including, can I bring my parent with me? Um, dig into that a little bit. Sometimes it's just a, you know what, I totally understand. This is a lot of information. This may be their first real job if they're closer to that 24 mark. Um, so just working with them trying to find ways to help them feel a little more comfortable. Um, they haven't been through life as much as um, those of us who are in our older generations. 
Providing them mentorship opportunities, a buddy, someone to train with is gonna be extremely important. Um, having flexibility um, is gonna be huge. Again, some of these individuals may still be in college and or are only looking for part-time. Um, so if you have those options or opportunities uh, available, those are what they're gonna be looking for. Um, ability to engage digitally. So this is, uh, you know, if you are, looking for someone, which we had talked about, to head up a marketing campaign or create some fun marketing material or just research some job boards or some, um, some places to share. Um, if you don't have a solid marketing um, department, put together a committee. Uh, putting individuals in an opportunity where they can um, do more than just what they've been hired to do. You don't even have to pay them more. This is a committee. This is an opportunity, um, you know, to give them to help you with these things. Uh, I would strongly encourage that you look for ways to do that. Company culture is huge. Uh, I was mentioning as we were on a quick break um, where I currently work, we have a slide. Uh, and so we are a church that uh, has taken over an old uh, two-story nightclub uh, about four years ago. And so our entire building is fun, lots of fun, uh, lots of opportunities to snap pictures, uh, you know, lots of fun places to sit and have lunch. We have a slide that goes from the second floor down to the first floor. Um, so looking for ways to not be so sterile uh, and looking for ways to um, give your folks a place to go have fun and or just kind of breathe and relax. Um, that's something that they're looking for. They are also going to be the ones that if you are saying this is our culture, they'll hold you to that. Um, so again, make sure that you are voicing the expectation of what your culture is um, so that they're not walking into a toxic situation uh, or department where, you know, your culture has, you, you want your culture to be one thing, but you haven't really done the work in order to make sure that that has filtrated or cascaded down um, to all the different levels in the organization and every department has kind of created their own culture. So make sure that you spend some work on culture. Benefits are important, but not as important as some of our older generations. And so by this benefits more than likely are going to fall around time off benefits. Uh, you know, what's the flexibility in my work schedule and where do they fit in? Again, thinking of ways to pull them in and on committees. Uh, you know, are there some extracurricular um, teams? Do you have a softball team? Do you have a bowling team? Uh, you know, there are, are different ways to pull in the younger generations. Uh, in a safe way. And again, just to give them some opportunity to participate at their level um, because they're used to being connected 24 seven to their phone. So what are some ways that you can um, find for them to have fun and or assist with that? So last, we're gonna talk a little bit about our Gen Z. So many of you um, probably are just starting to experience them coming into the workforce, especially if you're um, hiring at levels that are requiring any type of a license, certification, or degree. Uh, and so what are they looking for? Obviously, learning opportunities is huge. And so if you have these training programs, these are probably the individuals that you are going to want to target to pull into that. Um, they're the ones that are going to be participating in mentorship. Flexibility is huge. Uh, ability to engage digitally, uh, can, uh, their contribution to the company for sure. Um, again, looking for ways to connect them, looking for ways to ask them to be a part of something, um, whether that just be uh, creating a campaign, uh, but then coming back and thanking them, even on social media, uh, showcasing that you have a group of individuals that are at this demographic um, that are out in the community doing things or volunteer to paint uh, a few rooms uh, in one of your buildings or, you know, there's, there's different things that you can do. Um, there's also uh, many different opportunities for learning that are outside of your organization. Uh, I think we had mentioned before, if you look at your local chambers, some AHECs also may have some training opportunities. Um, talk to your community health organizations. They may have some training opportunities because these are the individuals that you want to get started, uh, the Gen Zs and the Gen Yers, and looking at that leadership um, uh, ladder. Uh, and so these individuals you're going to start identifying on, on the last two uh, generations are your leads. Are any of these individuals um, 
uh, at a place where you can provide them with that lead role and start them in some progression into leadership. So recruitment uh, tactics are going to be, you know, again, promoting benefits, um, finding ways to have fun, uh, how can they fit in, and are there some ways uh, for them to, if they work part-time in one department, can they also work part-time in another department? Um, are there ways for them to um, job share? So they're going to be looking for ways to feel entrepreneurial because some of them may already have a side job. Uh, living down here in Destin, uh, many people that work here have what we call a side hustle. And so um, they may also fall in line with that. So um, being a little more flexible to uh, allowing them to have um, a supplemental income or a second job, uh, however you call it uh, in your handbook, um, but knowing that in healthcare, uh, if someone's working part-time, providing them that opportunity to do that. Obviously, as long as it is not a direct uh, conflict with your position, um, but encouraging that and giving them that opportunity uh, is huge for this generation. Uh, so workplace attractions for boomers, mentoring and training, um, benefits and flexibility, Gen X, leadership, recognition. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be in person uh, or to a group. Uh, that I would say, know your workers. Some people love to be spotlighted to an entire company and or to an entire department or even in a meeting. Other people would just prefer a thank you note, pat on the back and their favorite, um, their favorite candy bar. Um, uh, you know, recognition can be huge. Benefits that support that mental place. When we talked about they have aging parents, they may also have younger children that they're supporting as well. Uh, for our Gen Yers, meaning and value, um, you're going to want to equip them uh, because lots of times they're managing our millennials. Uh, junior leadership, because they are the ones that we're looking to place into leadership uh, in, that, in that next uh, phase of their life. Uh, our Gen Zers, uh, they want to create value. Again, work-life balance. Uh, even though that's going to fall for everyone, uh, the younger our generation gets, the more um, not being at work is important. And so, um, you know, being able to give them as much flexibility and creativity around that is great. And collaborating. Um, many of them are in college, just coming out of college. They're used to doing um, projects with team members. And so if there are any ways that we can have them be on a committee, um, you know, or help plan an event. Uh, we had an event committee, we had a fun committee where we went around and um, we celebrated different holidays. Uh, and most of them were fun, unique holidays like Talk Like a Pirate Day or Eat Something on a Stick Day or uh, it's, you know, ice cream day. So we would bring an ice cream for breakfast. And so just, you know, again, finding ways to uh, let your your staff come up with ideas together, collaborate with people from multiple generations, and just do some fun things can uh, make all the difference in the world. So be aware of how generations are similar as well as different. I love this quote. At the end of the day, there's no size fits all. You need to find a balance between recruiting for the needs of the role, for the fit of the company, and for the fit of the candidate. So the next time you're walking through, uh, many of you may uh, be back to full capacity. Uh, some of you may not, um, but even walking into a Panera or your local restaurant, but when you're walking through your cafeteria, pay attention to where people are sitting. Are they naturally gravitated to sit with folks that are their own age? Uh, and or are they sitting with their work team? So some of that uh, can be a fun game to play internally and injecting yourself uh, into some of those conversations can be quite um, fun as well. It also is gonna give you an insight into what's important uh, for staff members that are of the generations that you're trying to recruit and even sitting and asking them some general questions. Uh, you know, it it's, it's, uh, can for sure be beneficial to that recruiting uh, process. So we talked a little bit about facts, stats and research. Um, again, relationships are huge. It's gonna focus uh, so much on asking those great questions and being able to direct individuals and provide um, an answer to what they're asking for when you're recruiting. And then ultimately we're looking for ways that we can just continue to retain as we move through uh, these, these next few years, which hopefully will not be as challenging as 2021 has seemed to be. So uh, that is what I have for uh, recruiting through the generations. Do we wanna ask any questions? Thanks to all the participants for joining us today and for participating in some breakout discussions. 
We look forward to seeing you next week for the next session in this series, um, which is where we'll focus on making your organization stand out. So identifying those unique selling points that, that Mike touched on today that health professionals want. So we wish you all a wonderful day. I don't see any questions in the chat. So we will close out today and we'll see you next week. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.